You are listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast, TV show deep dive bonus episodes. These were originally recorded as videos, but technical limitations kept us from getting them out to you, so we have retreated to the audio-only format of a podcast. I have done my best to remove the silences from when we were watching scenes and chaotic background noises, but otherwise not edited the content at all for coherent thoughts. As with our regular podcast episodes, you can find these ad-free through our Patreon at patreon.com slash Wattspoilers. Okay. Dun, 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 dun. Mission impossible. Finishing getting through this in one day, that is an impossible mission. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's probably not going to happen, and uh, that's... I mean, I, I got almost all my notes for the episode done. <laughs> almost. <laughs> but yeah, so here we are. This is one week out since uh, Wheel of Time episode one has finished. And we're here to uh, dive into it. Welcome to Wheel of Time spoilers. Season, season finale. one. Season finale. Yeah, we're <laughs> super excited about this. This is um, it's been a hell of a ride with ups and downs and craziness and changes and the excitement and anger and <laughs> vitriol and everything there's been a lot it, of emotions there's been a lot of emotions associated <laughs> with this that's all i'm gonna say so yeah and it was during like the holidays so we had even less brain cells and time t to like absorb the thing you know so it's a lot of emotions and a lot of life stuff all happening at once but it's 2022 and we are able to discuss episode eight now hopefully in it's not going to be one episode. It's just not. I need to stop thinking. It's going to be just one Just stop. Episode. Just stop. Just stop. <laughs> Part one of two, uh, at least. Yes. At least. At least. Screaming. Screaming. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Age of 3, Legends. 3,000 years ago. I was... How mm -hmm. much of that yep. original like prologue do you think... Did, I thought we were getting prologue, right? I saw this and I was like, prologue, here we go. Um, not what we got. Yeah, I expected it to be straight out of the book, um, and then it wasn't, and I'm mostly not, unha <laughs> not unhappy about that. I'm not unhappy with what necessarily was said, so much as uh, the tone. The tone? What, what about the, the tone? The lack of sheer, utter panic. <laughs> yeah, I'm very interested to learn um, what was going on in the... 10 years, 100 years prior to this conversation. Just so. A lot of talk about implications, but let's get dig into it, because this is probably the, the longest segment. So we start off on that dragon on his chest. It's a cool, it's almost more like a phoenix. It's got a very like feathery, mm -hmm. bird-like kind of styling well, it, to it. It's a fang, right? It's the, it's If you look at it, it's got the fang shape of the Aes Sedai symbol. Oh. So the round part huh. on top and then the whole like hook underneath. Yeah, I hadn't even noticed that. I was just really stuck on like this looks like a phoenix, not a dragon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no, for me it's it's I mean they're very much trying to stylize that dragon in the shape of of the the flame. And it looks a little fiery too. So Mhm. Mm and it's kind of got, you know, bits of the like Chinese dragon that we see on the dragon banner. It's kind of got echoes of that a little bit. So apparently this version doesn't have the subtitles. Huh. Interesting. That's going to make it hard. It's kind of cool seeing it without the subtitles and just having to hear the cadence of the words. <laughs> I really like the sound of the old tongue. I like what they did with it, and they mm -hmm. actually made it almost believable that this is a spoken language. Like, their language coach really worked with these actors to make it flow. Totally. Like, they weren't just reciting gibberish. They actually had the emotion behind the words, which was awesome. And then, like, the names and the words don't sound odd and out of place. They just sound right naturally in the middle of the rest of the sentences. I, I enjoyed that. Sorry, I'm just bringing up the actual Amazon version of it. You know, chat saying that they actually did this scene in English first before doing it in the old tongue. So they had, they really had the body language and the emotions necessary to do that. So, yeah. Uh, curious what you think about that. 
Well, I did a little bit of reading into the Latrella, her like wiki entry um, on this because I I haven't read nearly enough about how the exact breaking like went or the, the build up to it. I know there's a lot of that information like in the big white book um, that I haven't actually like read through. I've only ever flipped through it for like references. I've never just read it. Um, so I went and, you know, read the Wikipedia on it. And so far in this conversation, it this doesn't break the canon. Like, I'm very curious, like exactly how they are imagining if the drilling happened, how the collapse is going, um, if there's a war, like, yeah, well, I guess the war wouldn't have started yet. Um, but it's, I, I like that because this is the central conflict that drives what happens in the book. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I guess she won't agree. Yeah. She gets all the women to say, no, we're not going to help you with your plan. And then he goes and does it anyway. That is the crux of the problem. Sure. And in the books, it's more of she, the women are putting together the children call. And then the children call basically the man, the, they disappear, they get captured. And so basically Louis Theron saying the only plan is my plan because your plan has failed. Um, and it, he still does want the support. He thinks with the two of them, he can win. Uh, I, I'm not sure that necessarily in the book, she is as prophetic about the consequences. Everyone is taken by surprise by the backstroke, whereas here she makes it sound like an inevitability. Yeah, which it goes well with what we hear from the Aes Sedai, like in the modern age, like that that core of their identity has been there since they first, you know, had this split with the men. So like, narratively speaking, it's nice that there's like that continuity of like, this is what the women have always been doing. <laughs> this is how they've always focused. Um, but it, it does... You know, it, yeah, I just, I, I really wonder if there is a conflict at this point beyond just the cyclical nature of the Dragon Reborn thing, which, like, was Luz Theron in the books labeled Dragon Reborn or just Dragon? No, he gained the title the Dragon, and then the Dragon was then reborn as Rand. And that's what made Rand so yeah. special, because he was the Dragon Reborn. Born, and he's the only one who's ever had the memories reborn into him. So by claiming the title of Dragon Reborn here, LTT is sort of cutting, is undermining that a little bit because, you know, the assumption is the reborn part gives him the memories of his previous life. Yeah, and it's the, the concept that, that the dragon fights the Dark One cyclically is not something that they knew in the Age of Legends. As far as, right. as, as, as we far know as in we the know. books. Because they, they weren't even aware of the Dark One, right? Like, Right. It wasn't so until like, the Kreathon prophecy was... So, yeah. So, to me, yes, there, there's very much some lore change going on about what they know, what they suspect. The Dragon Reborn seems to be this thing that happens over and over and over again, and they know he's reborn. And that's why he's gained that title. Um, and he seems to be a consistent prophecy throughout all the ages. And the Dark One breaks out periodically and has to be thrown back periodically, which is yes. a huge yeah. lore change. Like there's no way to say that they discovered the dark one a few decades ago. If they have all this lore about how the dragon reborn has to make a choice with respect to the dark one, like, right, right. So and we don't know anything about the is land. Did land fear, uh, drill a hole. Do we have the column Dawn? There's a lot. We don't know about the war of power and canonically what the war of power is going to be like. Other than what we saw in the cartoons. Right. Which don't give us any clue as to what triggered the lead up to the breaking. Like, at all. Um, it does line up with, with, like, what Loghain gets given from the corruption. Like, all, all the dragons and stuff. Like, it, it kind of fits with that lore. But that lore is all new to the show. So... Um, um, I want to talk a little bit about set design, just like him in all black, her in all white, these curving oh archways, God, yes. the light bulbs in the yes. back, the glow bulbs, I should light say. Light bulbs. Oh, is that what that mirror thing That's is? what I would assume is it's two light bulbs, two glow bulbs, I should oh. say, with a mirror behind them. I sort of thought it was like a stylized like artwork, like a gong or something. I sure. Didn't think of it as technology. I was really struck by the the tilted mirror. I don't understand why the mirror has to be tilted down. 
that that was kind of what was catching my eye. <laughs> I've actually seen a lot of those. I feel like it gives you okay. So that actually does happen with big mirrors that are tilted high up because if they're or that are mounted high up because and I've seen this in fancy buildings. If you go in and the mirror is just flat against the wall, but it's like above your head, all you're going to see is like the ceiling and because right angle in looks angle out. So you're just looking to look up at the ceiling like you were looking through a window. Whereas if it's tilted down, you'll actually see your own reflection and the reflection of people behind you and people in the room. So I have seen that done in fancy hotels or, or, or big, you know, ballrooms, stuff like that. Huh. Cool. Well, that's that's neat and makes sense. It makes the room bigger and helps reflect light. I mean, it's it's neat. But that I I just wrote off the global things as being like random artworks at the ends of hallways. Um, but yeah, I love that he's all in black and she's all in white. Um, she has very comfortable looking pants, but she's got kind of like the business jacket thing on top, right, kind of like right. how Moraine's clothes are styled. Um, so it's you know it's it's not the same as what we've seen in the Third Age, but it's also like weird futuristic clothes are still a theme in the Age of Legends, well, which is fun. And if you think about it, Aes Sedai in the White Tower is uh, a straight through on culture, right? There, There's no interruption from the Age of Legends, it, it, especially in... Uh, I feel like it's more of a continuum in the show because they talk about how that's what they're here to stand for. That's why they're pres preserving. That's why the White Tower was founded. All that feels like it was done by Age of Legends Aes Sedai. Mm -hmm. And they have less generational turnover, so they're much like Ogier in that way uh, compared to the rest of the world. So, yeah, that through line is is very much there. I also love her jewelry. The, like, connected earrings is like, that's so impractical and futuristic looking. I love it. <laughs> also, she's got the ring, too. That yes. weird triple ring thing. They both have that. Mm-hmm. Um, to stop his influence from ever touching. Yeah. So this. Yeah. This is the core of how Rand has to deal with the actual last battle. Like, to seal the Dark One away completely would ruin the world, right? So LTT here is already making that mistake. This overly idealistic idea that you can actually stop the Dark from being part of life. Yeah. It's, and again. Arrogance the, on a stick. Part of that is what is the lore, right? What's. You know, is this something that happens on a regular basis? Is this something he's like, I can lock him away forever? Or is this like, we discovered him recently? Uh, yeah, I just have, this gives me so many questions. Not necessarily like bad questions. It's just like, I need to know. This doesn't fit the history that I know, is all I'm saying. Yeah, for sure. It's, it, I want more exposition and to, to know what's going on here. Because it, it seems like from this conversation that, there's an expectation that he has to go confront the Dark One, and that is predicted by prophecy or by engineering or whatever, and it's just a matter of what he does at that point. But he has to do something, and he's got this overly idealistic idea about, like, stopping the Dark One forever, and it's it's almost like what happened with Rand in the books was from a prior age, and now we're, like, around to, like, another iteration of it, like, quite literally, um, I really hope that when we get to like, you know, the Sean Chan and the Aiel, we get other fragments of their understanding of the history that like makes this make sense on a rewatch. The one thing this does really pull off is the um, the feeling of like a left right political argument where they're just arguing past each other. They've made their points a thousand times. They already know what the other person is. They've already made up their mind. No one's going to change anything. They're just arguing past each other again. Like they've done for a thousand times before. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. It's definitely it, it gives you a sense that this is not a spur of the moment conversation. This is a very long and well reasoned like debate that more than just these two people are involved in. Probably one thing I did have to say, she said Sidene there, not. Yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> it makes me think that the old tongue is kind of like a like a romance language where like things are gendered. Uh, depending on uh, what you're saying. Uh, so it's like the the one power, like you either call it Sidar or Sidene, depending on like who you're referencing. It's not two halves of the power. It's two words for one power. Yeah, I caught that too. Fair. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it does mean when she says you're, you're exposing the one power to him, she's specifically talking about the male half is what I think. Yes. Yes. So, and that, they could throw us back a thousand years or more makes me think that, again, this is a battle that happens every couple thousand years or something. 
Mm -hmm. And there's some sort of like longer form, like sense of we have to progress despite these things. And it, it, and it's funny, like it'll throw us back a thousand years or more. I mean, uh, yeah. try try a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, more more than a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, her diarist prediction is like, that's cute. Um, but she's also not wrong. And I, I'm really curious, like, is her argument about your opening up the power to corruption, like, is that just a theoretical guess on her part? Or is that something that they know right. is going to happen? Where's the foreknowledge? Like, How is the she... The engineering of the power. <laughs> she seems to have foreknowledge. Is that just good deduction or is it prophecy? Yeah. Like, I just, I want to know what's going on in the column Don right now. <laughs> If you help us, we won't fail. That's a lie. We would have just corrupted both sides of the power and the entire world would have broken like an egg. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that they've changed that much of the lore. I think that that would have been a bad call, <laughs> even in the show version. This always this was a weird line to me because it's like you it's it's pointing out that they're in a nursery. It's like we've seen the baby. We don't need to have it pointed out to us that the fate of the world was decided in a nursery. I think we do, though, because LTT is a dramatic bitch. I think that that's pretty much entirely he's got this prideful flair for the dramatic and everything is about him. Um, no. And it also drives home that you should pay attention to the nursery when it comes up in Rand's confrontation at the end of the episode. But I think it's mostly that LTT is a dramatic bitch. And it also, Drama queen. yeah, and it, it wasn't quite the end. He's like, that was it. That was the time we decided the fate of the world. It's like, wait, really? Like that, that didn't seem quite like a definitive. No, it was just like, nah, we're still not going to do it. He's like, oh, okay. Now you're causing the issues. It's like, they've always said no. It, it does feel a little bit. Yeah, it's um, he's twisting the situation. I mean, they're both twisting the situation, right? She's like, nothing was decided here. It's all up to you. And he's like, well, I've decided that if you don't help me, um, that's what's going to happen. So, yeah, again, like you said, they're kind of talking past each other on this. Um, I do like what uh, chat has said that it maybe also draws attention to the fact that it's his nursery rather than hers, because in many stories, right, it would be the woman's nursery. But nah, it's his. Um but yeah, it's uh he's he's just being a really dramatic. He's a drama queen. I mean, it I would almost say he's not being dramatic enough because it really is the fate of the world. He's just like, "Oh, hum, to think the fate of the world." I'd be like, "You crazy person. I can't believe you're just throwing us over the edge here." I mean, cuz he has to do something, right? He has this confrontation and he's thinking I could make this the last confrontation rather than the latest confrontation. Exactly, right? Like yeah, if this was just another in a line of confrontations, that would be one thing. But this is like the last one. You'd think there would be some sort of desperate pleading attempt. But I don't think he's desperate. I feel like the war of power like either hasn't happened at all or has happened in a very different way because this feels like a very academic prospect to him rather than trying to put out a fire before it burns your house down that maybe the dark one is more like a presence in the background that causes like a higher level of crime and murder but doesn't actually like isn't on a world ending thing but then like then why is the dark one even a threat like i, I it, yeah. I'm really hoping that we get some of the like dark friends drilling into the bore kind of there was a an undermining of the security of their world that he's fighting against in addition to just the dark one exists but I it's it's so far out of book lore it's hard to do more than just speculate like any other fan. The idea that he's not invincible that he must actually Mhm. Mm the, the part where she says she's overwhelmed does make me think that the world might be a little bit more under strain uh, than a perfect utopia. Like, why is she overwhelmed? Is it just because he has this grandiose plan or is it because, like, society's starting to fray from an increasing influence from the Dark One? Like, it can't just be normal politics, right? It's like, I feel like she's referencing, like, we have this bigger problem and your pride is getting in the way. Agreed. Agreed. I think there's there's something going on. But yeah, someone says, uh, an, uh, no, two more animated shorts would have been really nice here to help explain some of this stuff. And I can't believe Ugh. they were playing, right? If you're doing eight episodes. It, it, seriously. God, how did you think we didn't want eight 
animated shorts. And she definitely says in the old tongue, Dragon Reborn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Latra. And I, yeah, we don't get much history about her. Yeah, it's just, if you go to the wiki, there's a whole thing about how this conflict went down. She actually, like, ended up being a big general in the war against the Shadow, but all the records were destroyed, so that's why there's no mention of her in the books. Like, the wiki is worth reading. Um not very relevant to what ha- actually happens in the books. It was just like the backstory that RJ wanted to create um, and never made it into the real text. But um, yeah, she's she's the Tamerlan seat, not LTT, which is interesting. Um, and Watcher of the Flame is a, a it, it, that changes over time. Instead to, of Watcher, you know, of, the Watcher of the Seals, Flame of Tarvalon, um, which is interesting. I don't mind the Tamerlan seat change because i see tamerlan is just like oh the old tongue for amerlin oh yeah i know i honestly kind of thought i kind of like forgot that it was supposed to be him i was like wasn't she always tamerlan <laughs> like i don't know why i just made that switch in my head um well that because he was the head of all Aes Sedai. so the tamerlan is the head of Aes Sedai, and in this case it makes her sort of the head of Aes Sedai, but the head of the female Aes Sedai, maybe uh, you know, in, this, in uh, someone made a point. It seems like in this case, the Dragon Reborn is a title, and Amer- Tamerlan Seat is a title. Mm. Does that make sense? And like she sort of has that seat that makes her equal to him in a way. I mean, I think it's just that they're both really powerful channelers, and he's. Yeah, I don't know. I hadn't really thought about it that hard. I guess like he's clearly in charge of the males, and she's clearly in charge of the females, but. I feel like back, you know, in the books, it seems like he's the Tamerlan who's in charge of both. Yeah, and I don't know if he's in charge of the males or if it's just one of those one power things where whoever's strongest leads, you know, like maybe it's not truly like he's formally in charge. Like, I don't feel like Tamerlan's seat and Dragon Reborn are equivalent positions. Like Dragon Reborn is who you are. Tamerlan's seat is an office you hold. So I think it's just a matter of he's so powerful that naturally he's leading a faction, but she's the one who's ostensibly politically in control. Ah, uh, I don't know. <laughs> My heart broke for that. Yeah, because he's going to come home <laughs> that and smile. kill her. Yeah, that's the last time she sees him not broken. And then the city. Okay, so it's beautiful cityscape, futuristic cityscape, and of course, mm-hmm. as I've seen all over the internet, it's a ma- exact match for the ruined city shot that we saw and commented on quite extensively um, in episode, was that three? Oh, that was episode one. Okay. Yeah, that's like the how we get introduced to Moraine is with the chase. Oh, that's right. So this is the spot on which... Right. The, right. the man who's channeling is trying to run into these ruins into these and get ruins. stopped right at the gate. That's right. Um, and yeah, but it's a perfect match because of the, the stadium and some of the buildings and the river. And yeah, it's it's been pointed out extensively online. There is no question. Right. I'm kind of mad about it. Really? Why? Well, because the entire face of the world was supposed to be changed. You're not supposed to still have skyscrapers standing from an Age of Legend city. Mm, you like, want it. I'm that's not how my breaking worked in my head. You wanted it to be more um, like in the last 3000 years. These things have yeah. been built. Like and every torn. Age of Legend city was ground to dust and smashed into pieces and turned into goddamn mines. I mean, we know that there's an Age of Legend city that is a freaking mine. Um, and then this is just like some of the buildings are still standing. Yeah. Like arr. <laughs> some places they they did tell like transport from one place to the other, like the land around them folded, but they were relatively intact, intact. So I could see like a chunk of a city staying intact and, and moving from one place to another. I always, you know, I actually did think that some of the this ruins were Age of Legends ruins. And oh, yeah, definitely. That's always been my headcanon that we have Age of Legends. I mean, talk about. You know, the the Tower of Genji, that's an Age of Legends thing or previous. Um, well, but it's from the Snakes and Foxes. It gets a pass. It doesn't quite exist in reality the same way everything else does. But uh, Zul in, in chat is pointing out there were the docks on the mountain side mm-hmm. that clearly had to have been an Age of Legends ruin. So I guess not every single city was ruined, but it kind of annoyed me that they it seems like they're making the breaking less destructive. But that's probably just because they need the continuity. 
storytelling wise. As far as things I'm not mad about, uh, flying cars. Yeah, very I cool. See some showings. Yeah, <laughs> very definitely. okay with flying cars. Um, I like the the futuristic designs of the buildings for sure, and I'm curious about the wall in the back. Mm-hmm. Like, is that a dam? Is that a military fortification? I thought it was what? a dam because What's if you the wall? Th- there's a, if you look right dead center of the picture, there's actually uh, a waterfall coming out of the ma- the wall, and then a river that leads um, through the city, and then to the left. Is that a waterfall? I thought it was. Oh, interesting. Well, a dam. That whole hmm? canal leads up to the wall, and there's a, a what looks like a, a power generator right there. Is it the, where exactly is straight over the? stadium thing okay okay and i also feel like i can almost see like a water level behind the thing yes 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 put my hand right across it that's helpful um okay so and that makes more sense to me because i was looking at being like if there isn't a war of power going on and also war of power makes walls not very strategic it's like why would they have a wall around the city like this isn't like an ancient roman fortification like walls never would have made sense but a dam for hydropower i I could buy that pretty easily yeah it does look a little like an alien planet yeah it's like a it feels it feels like rome in so many ways with this big central stadium in the middle next to a river and like uh but then of course you've got you know this like modern downtown London kind of buildings. This triangle building is one of the most intriguing ones to me, just with the massive Ooh. base on it. Yeah, I didn't look at the buildings nearly as much as I could have. Um, yeah, I I like the imaginings of of this. Um, and then we get our intro, and I'll take one final look uh, here. Do we get any more stars? I don't think we do. I'm so perplexed. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's exactly the same as it's always been. Yeah, it's I, every time I watch it, there's a different number of stars. Doesn't matter which episode I'm on, which rewatch I'm on. It's never the same as I, I'm going to at some point have to just cut them all out and just fucking compare them because that's the only way I'm going to be able to trust the results of my eyes. <laughs> um, and so back to the blight right where we cut off on episode seven with Random Rain. Mm-hmm. Which the extras about how they built this set are really cool. Oh, I didn't actually watch those. I watched some casting ones, but what did they say about the? I uh, haven't watched set? the casting ones at all. <laughs> but yeah, no, they the way they talked about building this set um, is it's pretty cool from a technical and from a narrative uh, perspective. Uh, I, I appreciate knowing how much of this is practical effects. The one thing I'll say about the casting is I was a little disappointed that we, there was nothing from Barney Harris. Not a single word spoken by him in the entire casting thing, which is we, you know, it's fine. I, you know, I don't, I don't want to dig into why he left, but like they didn't talk about bringing him on. They, they like talked about everybody else and how perfect they were for the roles and had interviews with everybody else. And there wasn't anything that wasn't a group shot with Barney Harris in it, um, which I found a little odd. Um, he's really been cut out of pretty much everything. There is a story there that I don't want to know. <laughs> don't want to know and i don't want the dirty laundry but there is clearly a story of some capacity because i was i was interested in like i wanted to know what they thought about barney you know bringing him on like in the same way that i'm curious why they brought on perrin and why they brought on Rand and why they brought on Egwene and all that stuff was in there i just i wanted the same amount of of context to be given to barney um and you know the uh i thought the most funny thing was when perrin said, and again, I'm saying parent instead of the actor's name, but he was like, you know, in the beginning, we all tried to pretend we weren't exactly like the characters in the books, but we really are just almost exactly like the characters in the books. Like, there really was, like, there's a lot of us in these characters. We were hired on like that. We ended up, like, leaning into it a little bit as we became friends. Um... Yeah. Oh, that's... I can't wait to watch that Mm -hmm. stuff. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, and a lot of those interviews were clearly done, like, during filming, Right. As they were filming, like during filming of season two, uh, mm-hmm. episode two or during filming of episode three. So, yeah, you know, I know that stuff has to be on film for Barney. They just haven't put it in there. Mm hmm. Gross. Very gross. So it's, gross. But I imagine that's what a dead body in a forest would do. Right. I mean, it would get mushrooms and rot and all those sorts of things. With the exception of the eyeball still being intact, that's not something that would still 
that that's the one part that breaks the immersion for me is if you are that decomposed your eyeballs are long gone <laughs> the only oh. thing i'm thinking is maybe this will like happened yesterday oh that's fair rapid yeah, light the, decomposition the, yeah yeah rapid decomposition <laughs> I, I could see that for sure um in which case the eyeball is more realistic uh than it could have been it's a mushroom man <laughs> uh, and this is basically how Balthamel fell to uh, the green man. So it's a teensy little echo of that. Um, obviously, the good guys are losing in this particular scenario compared to with the green man. But uh, yeah, I miss this. I miss Semeshta and the green man. Uh, and there's still definitely a possibility that that exists and can be brought in for some other that he could be guarding something else that he could be, you know, the grove and the green man isn't necessarily ruled out entirely because it wasn't used at the end of season one. Maybe they're going to wait until they have a chance to introduce it with the Aiel visions and then have Rand meet Somesha instead of meeting him modern first and then going back. They're just going to flip the order so that way there's more like emotional impact uh, with. Or the maybe green they're going to wait till they have a budget to animate him. <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. What do you think test yourself against the blight means when the blight is just a bunch of rotting starfish trees? What does that mean? I assume there's other threats in the blight that we're not seeing. That there are Trollocs that are in the blight. There are other things that can kill you. I know this, the whole fact worms is just there are worms and, and sticks that. and all that stuff. Like we don't get it, but like she doesn't specify why the blight's dangerous. You know? Yeah. So she also doesn't seem overly concerned with running into any of those hazards. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean the whole leaving land behind, but there might be Trollocs is like, I, mm, mm. I mean, there have to be Trollocs. They just had how many thousands of Trollocs like past them in the night going in the other direction. How did they not like encounter any of those? And... Yeah. Well, no, I think yeah, they said like I... thousands, thousands of Trollocs going through the no, yeah, hundred thousand, hundred thousand. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. A hundred thousand came out of the blight. Like how, and they just didn't encounter the people who were going into the blight. Like, yeah, it's, th there's a lot of rules around the blight that are, feeling more movie magic than clever storytelling which fine but also i just there's a line in here where she talks about changing distance so we'll get to it but it's when we get to the seven towers oh i i was confused by that line and had a different headcanon to make it make sense um the only other thing here that i wanted to point out is she says don't touch anything meanwhile she's constantly brushing the trees off of her face and they keep brushing by the trees and in the books we know that there are sticks which will eat your flesh and it, it it's hard for me to be like don't touch anything all except for the moss and the branches and it, it's like mm, whatever you do don't drink any don't. tea it's, you know, it's like, what? what, what? Yeah, like, what are you not supposed to touch? Because clearly touching the foliage is fine. And there's nothing else that you could choose to touch. So, like, what, what is happening? What was the danger? Well, you know, that we, we complained about that when they went into it in episode seven. We're like, well, they better show us what's actually dangerous in here. And they didn't. Mm -hmm. They showed us dead body. Though I will say... There is evidence of them drinking water from water bottles that they bring along, and I am very pleased about that, because I was <laughs> railing on them for not taking water bottles, and <laughs> turns out I just missed that. They did take water bottles. I rescind my complaints on that front. They could have done a better job of showing them with supplies, but they did have supplies. I think I, I think I mentioned that. I was like, eh, maybe they just have water bottles like under their cloak or something, and you're like, no, we yeah, can't see them. And I was like, that's bullshit. <laughs> and then they have them here, so I was wrong. <laughs> So, spreads from the Dark One's prison and consumes everything in its path. That very, and again, they're making the eye of the world the place of the Dark One's prison. Whereas in the books, the, you know, he makes the point over and over again, the Dark One's prison is everywhere. It's a metaphysical thing. Mm -hmm. And the boar is not at the eye of the world. Like, those are very separate locations. So that's interesting but it makes a lot of sense i mean if you consider at the end of the books how there's like that one saw suspended in rand's eye 
like the concept and the, even your theory of uh, the Dark One's prison until I run Riyadh being related, like the center of the world, the eye of the world, the middle of the hurricane, like for all those things to be compiled into one item is like, that's efficient. I, I get it. I saw someone point out that Lanfear's first words to Rand um, are in the dream world when the Grolm are coming and she says, shoot it in the eye. Ah! Oh! Shoot the dark one in the eye. Shoot the eye in the dark one. I, mm, yeah. I, I, I like that. And also, we don't know if this truly is the Dark One's prison and the boar, this is just what they believe to be the Dark One's prison and the boar. Because there's quite a bit of evidence yeah. here. There's quite a bit of evidence that they're being lied to. Right? So much. So much. That that this was all set up in advance by um, Ishamael to get Rand to break the seal. Right? I think they're all being manipulated from the dream to what they think it is to um, Moraine giving him the song real. Yeah, I bet we're going to get discussion about the boar being, or the Dark One's prison being everywhere and nowhere. I think we're going to get that when the Forsaken start, you know, knowledge dropping on Rand and gaming with each other. I think we're going to get more of that. Like, ha ha ha, silly children, you didn't think the Dark One's prison had a door on it? That would be stupid, you know? I think it's where the rest of the Forsaken are imprisoned. Mm, yeah, you're not going with the uh, one Forsaken per seal? Uh, line no. of thinking. And I'll tell you why. Um, there are there were nine statues, right? So we're, I'm going to go off the assumption that there are nine Forsaken, not 13. One of them is clearly free. Ishamael, not fully bound, however you want to call it. When you look at the eye of the world, the seal, it's the yin-yang symbol in the center, and on the outside is a eight spikes, which I think one of those spikes represents each of the eight Forsaken, and also there are eight cracks in the ground afterwards. Mm, and so I think mm -hmm. the eight matches uh, the remaining it. number of Forsaken, and by you know destroying the seal, he essentially has freed each of those. Each crack frees a Forsaken, and that's how we get the Forsaken into the series. That would make sense, because saving a Forsaken to come out at the very end when the last seal breaks would be underutilizing the Forsaken. <laughs> we kind of need them all out sooner than that. So I, I dig that. That makes a lot of sense. Oh, yeah. Slight double entendre there. Young men in way over their heads looks up at Rand. Oh, yeah. Sh that's not even subtle. No. <laughs> I almost was like, do I have to comment on that? Did everyone see that? Everyone saw that, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, everyone, even Rand, even the wool-headed sheep herder saw that. <laughs> that frantic need to do something, but having no idea what to do. That is very emblematic of all of our two rivers heroes. <laughs> they don't do patience well. None of them do patience. And that frantic packing of like, I can't do anything, so I'll pack just in, you know. I'm going to go after him with everything I've got, even if it's just the fact that I have an extra change of clothes. It's something I got. And yeah, she's she's acting out of pure frantic terror. There's no rational thought really happening for her. And good thing parents, like, I have half a brain cell more to think about this <laughs> rationally. Um, it's, it's good. It's good he thinks it through. And all the parent ran shippers rejoiced. <laughs> my parent confirmed. I mean, well, I mean, he, clearly he's not talking about like a fraternal love because there's literally only one kind of love in the world. There are not seven kinds of love. There is only one kind of love. And the only explanation for this line is that Perrin is in love with Rand. Or, <laughs> or I, mean, I think what it really does is it takes Egwene's love for Rand and puts it on a brotherly level. You think Egwene's talking like brother or sibling love for Rand? Yeah. Um, I think I think she's talking. She wants it to be emotional, romantic love. And I think that she's lost that. I think that now, I think she's losing that. I think she's her romantic love for Rand is turning into a sibling love. And that this, like, I love him and, and parents saying, I love him too, as a brother. Just the way you do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I, I do as much as I like to think that this is still by Perrin confirmed and that there is a bit of a ship there. Like it makes way more narrative sense to be like, no, there are other kinds of love than romantic love, because that is something clearly the script's been giving us this whole time. Also, like Greek philosophers. So. <laughs> so that I have thoughts about that. I liked it as 
And here's where I'm coming from. Because if they're going to have the whole ridiculous crush love, right, that got sort of brought up in an argument, and then the two of them were like, are we all right? Is this, is, are you really crushing on me? He's like, no, we're always going to be right. This is not, let's just move past that. We're just siblings. We're just friends. We acknowledge the weirdness and we're moving past it. Yeah, I this line to me, I agree with everything you're saying. And to me, this line says that this made me think that Perrin and Egwene were probably friends before Rand was a friend to either of them. And they have been friends for so, so, so long that anyone could be forgiven for being like, do they have a thing? But like, actually, they've just like literally been friends since the dawn of time. And Rand and Rand's relationship to both of them post dates them being like, you know, toddlers just being watched by their parents and just always being together. The, we, we had speculated before that that might have been their backstory. And this interaction to me is just like, oh, yeah, those are just siblings from other families. That's that's what this relationship is. And townies versus farmers, right? Like she's he's a blacksmith. She's the the mayor's daughter. They both spend a lot of time in that central square. Um, whereas Rand is out on the farm with his sheep, right? Like they probably saw each other much more because they didn't have to travel exactly. to town to see each other. Um, so yeah, I can see them being closer friends in that way. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, sure, the middle school crushes are a thing. They absolutely happen. Um, but yeah, I think that what they're saying here is like, was that weird thing? Like, that wasn't a thing. Like, we're, we're fine. We've always been fine. And parents like, yeah, we've known each other since we were like two. Like, we're, we're never not going to be fine. Also, they were both friends with Lila. And like, it, it's just it, it's a whole like swarm of puppies, you know? <laughs> And it's an adult way to handle that conversation, to acknowledge the feelings are there. They could have been there, but we're not going like we're not going to act on them. We're both going to be mature and move past that. Right. Like, right. Because it's like we just had a brief crush at different times and we've never wanted to act on it. And and then she's like, are we good? Because I need a fucking hug. Right. Exactly. Right now. Yeah, I can't yeah. go running after Rand. I need a goddamn hug. <laughs> and parents like, I mean, mood. <laughs> no, I thought that was a very good redemption scene for the shit that was their threesome. I I was very glad that they're like, nope, that was just a weird red herring nonsense thing that no, there's no we're not going to see that come up again. Like that storyline has been put to fucking bed, <laughs> which is happy. Yeah, Don't touch these vines. You're just pushing out of your way. Yeah, exactly. Don't touch anything. Sits on a rock like. <laughs> Why? <laughs> are rocks not things? Rocks are things. Do those look like towers to you? I guess. I mean, if they're covered in the starfish trees, like Kutu. Mm. Then... Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, they, yeah. They look I guess to me I can like see they that are whole... covered in the blight. They aren't that makes sense. Like, just ruins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was how I interpreted that. Um which is creepy as hell. It's very much like this bacterial overgrowth kind of aesthetic. Which, I mean, obviously, if he was born there, it's only been that way for 40 at most. Right, right. If he's about 40 years old, then we don't know the year that it, it got taken over. But Okay, so explain this. Explain this. Three years ago, it was miles from Tarwin's Gap. Yeah. Three years ago, it it is referring to the Seven Towers, not the Blight. See, I I wonder if that's shitty editing, and they were talking about the Blight, and and like because it mm, the, the Blight doesn't fold space. I think it does. I think I think that we're getting I think he's bringing a lot of the last battle forward. The blight is bending space in the same way that it does in the last battle that, that you get closer. Things are closer together in the same way it bends time. Um, hmm. And space. Yeah. You, you, you know, space time, right? You're bending it. And so over time, the blight is getting stronger. It's basically sucking the world into it. And, and time and space is constricting inside the blight. And so it used to be much further away from Tarwin's Gap. Hmm. But they've only been hiking for a couple a hours. A few hours. Yeah. Which you can hike a few miles 
across a plane, you can hike several miles in a few hours. But through this bullshit, it's going to be... I mean, that's difficult right. terrain in D&D parlance. Right. Um, so, my, hmm. my assumption is physical distance is actually changing in the Blight as it grows stronger. I did not get that complex. I just assumed that was a shit edit. Um, that was all I thought. Because... And she says, just another sign... Because- Sorry, just know the sign that the Dark One's strength is building. I don't think the Blight is a sign that the Dark One's strength is building. I think the fact that distance itself is constricting is the sign of the Dark One's strength building. See, I... Because I caught on the, the three years ago line, and I'm like, is this another one of those nods to the fact that the books are set three years earlier in the chronology than what's happening here because of the whole aging people up. And in the books, it takes them a couple of hours of writing before they really get into the blight proper. So I just thought it was like, literally, if it had taken three years longer, the blight would have grown closer to, to Tarwin's gap. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm digging your explanation more because it allows me to not be so mad about the ridiculous time issues involved with travel. Um, it explains the edit. It explains her line without it being a crap edit. Like you've come up with a far more like watertight explanation for what's going on. And I, I think I'm, I'm going to sign up for that. I, I like that better. Well, and also we know that, um, like the eye moved in the books. Right? I mean, it did. So, you know, that was because of the whole magical properties of, of Semeshta and But we never really get an explanation for why the eye is where it needs to be, other than it's just where it needs to be, right? Like, so we don't get that, but we do get the physical moving of the eye. And so that is, I think, is what they're trying to incorporate here, is that the, the eye itself is actually moving as the blight constricts and as the dark one becomes more powerful. And that's why it's so close. And I mean, yeah, time and space do warp near the Dark One's prison in the last battle. So why not have that be just a constant property across the entire history like that? That works a lot better than saying that they had a shit edit. I I dig it. (laughs) What is that? That is not a water bottle. That is like a a kerchief wrapped around something. And I want to believe it's drugs. Mm. I want to believe it's drugs. Uh, I I thought it was just (laughs) a water bottle, but... Um, no, I it's, think it's her The water bottle is a stiff. The water bottle is a really like molded stiff thing. And that it, it looks crumply like it's a pouch with a drawstring. So I like, is it Lambus bread? Is it like, you know, cocaine tablets? Like, I think it shut the hell up and stop asking strength? me emotional questions, <laughs> bread. Cause he asked, did, uh, did it hurt to leave behind? Be. Instead of answering, she says, here, stuff this in your mouth and shut the hell up. Yeah. I, yeah. But I, I really want to think that it's some kind of highly concentrated uh, food with maybe a little stimulants in it. I want that to be a stimulant substance. <laughs> but we don't get a, a picture of him doing anything with it, so we just get to head cannon. No, uh, what little Jen is saying? To to- toddler food. Here, eat this and shut up and be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Either that or it's just lumbus spread, because, you know, reality's bending. I guess you get that from the snakes and foxes? Yeah, sure. What? Disapprove. Disapprove. I disapprove on multiple fronts. Yeah. First of all, okay. Because. Okay, A, why doesn't Lan pick it up, right? How does Lan not know Moraine's Uh, tell? Right. B, you can't tell us there's a tell without telling us what the tell is. Pray tell. (laughs) <laughs> right? Sure. Like you can't I think it's be like, like she always turns left stronger than right or something. <laughs> like, like, you can't be like, oh, you've got to tell, and be like, what is it? Go go find her. Tell us what it is. It, is that she limps? Is it like, it, 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 it really upsets me that they are saying that there's a tell without tell. I would totally be fine with a tell if they would let us, if they said it's because she likes to reach out and break a branch or something. I, I don't even know. Like, what could you do that was obvious, obvious enough for Nynaeve to track and land a miss? Yeah. Also, they were on horses the whole time after the two rivers, whereas they aren't on horses now. Also, Moraine was, like, sick and letting Land do all the work when they when uh, Nynaeve was tracking them. 
Also, like in the books, canonically, Moraine and Lan have an entire language of trail signs that they use to communicate to each other when they aren't traveling. To- so you're telling me that in 20 years, Lan has never, ever been away from Moraine and needed to find her in the wilderness? Like, that's bullshit. It, I, I am... Ah! I d- also, I really liked the part where where Nynaeve actually tracked Lan. The idea that Lan's actually untrackable and it was the clumsy city girl eyes to die and that's how Nynaeve... Like, I, no! A huge part of the respect that Lan has for Nynaeve is the fact that she tracked him. Also, can we just talk about a Chekhov's gun that they set up in whatever episode it was, four or five, where they... Um, maybe even three, where he's she's like... He's like, I have to ask, how did you track me? And she's like, I said you could ask. But he, I'm I not said you tell. could ask. But, and like, yeah. and that, and, and so it's like, oh, okay, telling. awesome. That's a huge uh, setup. Give us the payoff. Let us know what the tracking thing was. And the tracking thing can't be, oh, I didn't track you. I tracked somebody else. That's not a good payoff. No. It, it cheapens the whole basis of their relationship. It cheapens Lan's and Moraine's entire professional career together. It's just a short, easy way to get from point A to point B narratively. And I'm mad about it. Yeah. And, and I think it's got a, like I said, I think it's even, even apart from the lore change or anything like that, I think it's just a terrible payoff. It was a terrible setup. It, it was a great setup for a terrible payoff. Yeah. Yeah. Not happy with it. <laughs> Not happy with it. And then a complete lack of him tracking, a complete lack of him fighting. Like, Lan disappears for the entire fight just to pop out after everything's done. In oh, the right he looks place at the, the right seven time. towers. That's right. That's he he right. spends a whole two seconds looking at the seven towers and being sad about it. I mean, come mm-hmm. on. Oh, yeah, that's totally. <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's very, very, uh, yeah, there's not a lot of payoff for the blight given how much it features in Eye of the World. We got a very anemic delivery on the blight all, all around. And, and that goes along with his complete lack of pledge to fight the Blight till death, right? He's not doing that, as far as I can tell. That's not what he's, you know, because he has no reason to die, right? Well, that's in, in the books. He, his reason to die is, I'm going to go fight the Blight. To, well, to avenge the, Malkyr. It's, it makes no sense in the books. It's a dumbass. It's a dumb mission. thing in the books. Yeah, yeah, totally. So Don't mind I'm that kind changing. of glad that Sholan is like a little smarter with his energy. Totally, totally. I was very excited that they used this line. However, it doesn't make sense in the context of what she just said. Because she said, um, a wisdom never weds, but maybe I'll go become. And I said, I, and I can wed. And he's like, oh, I'll hate the man you choose. But at no point have they ever had a discussion about how he can't be with her because of his war against the blight. It's only about how she can't be with him because she's the wisdom. Yeah, I I want to think that this is cause, cause, him breaking into this speech, them having this conversation felt very incongruous to me. Like yes, they were having same. one conversation and then they started having another one. Yes, yes, um, absolutely. And that was like. I appreciate that they kept this conversation from the books because it's so goddamn perfect and good and is the reason why Laniv is such a popular ship. But it fell out of place here. And the only way I can make it make sense is that she is effectively sending him on a suicide mission to get Rand. Got you. And that's the only way I can bridge that. But I don't know how he's supposed to bring Rand back if he's also supposed to die in the attempt. Like, right. Not really clear on what's happening, but the delivery is amazing. The performances are amazing. It's just out of place against the whole story. So I'm very... They did a great job. I just don't understand why here. Yeah. Like and I don't, I don't understand. could have been yeah. saved for a different experience, a different instance entirely. Like, I didn't need it here. Also, shouldn't the lioness be um, Elaine? He does say lioness, though, in the books, I think. Okay. Um, I got more mad at uh, your fierce like a warrior. I'm like, bitch, like a warrior? She is a warrior. Fucking devalue my wisdom. Whatever. Like, I get it. She's not professionally a warrior, but it's just very like... Ugh, not yet. She will Like be. a warrior. She is a warrior. <laughs> I think that... Yeah. <laughs> 
that creepy. <laughs> that's the blight. That's the blight that I wanted to see. I'm, I was almost ashamed this was part of a dream. Because that would have been, oh, okay, the blight actually is threatening. You stop for a minute and it starts to grow over you. If he hadn't lifted his arm, I would have liked to see him struggle to get his arm out of there, you know? It, even after he woke up. Right, or like have like it coming up his arm, or like a mushroom sprouts from his bicep, or something. Or when he wakes up from the dream, the moss has grown over him a little yes. bit. Yes, yes, yes. And like that adds to the unreality. I was, I loved seeing this and was a little bit like, oh, it was just a dream. <laughs> Darn. Because yeah. I was like, oh, that's what makes the blight threatening. Perfect. They stop for that's a second why and a now. 30 minute time exactly. limit. Like, exactly. Go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah. But it's really cool looking. <laughs> it was brutal. But I never for half a second thought she was dead. Oh, no. That was how I knew it was a dream. I was like, is this a dream or not? Oh, she got killed. Clearly, it's a dream. <laughs> it's, it's a dream. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and so I, I will say that, you know, maybe one too many fake out deaths. I could use. I, she didn't really have to kill her in the dream. I do like that it foreshadows how quickly she gets taken out of the battle, though. She's set up as this great, strong warrior and then... Just like that, she's taken out. And you're like, oh, it's a dream. She's going to be able to do all kinds of cool stuff when it comes to the confrontation. And then literally she gets taken out literally that fast um, in the real world. So this is not the fake out death I would have eliminated from the list of unnecessary fake out deaths. I think this one kind of worked. But yeah, they really leaned into the fake out death for this to a degree that I don't think a lot of people are happy with. I think most people are like. So is death not a thing? Like, right, ever? right. Never but this, uh, this, I, I, I did like this one, kind of. It's also really brutal. <laughs> it's it is very really brutal. fucking brutal. No, 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 paused on a think a good stop scene right there. Um, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, great dream. Um, and I think it is Rand's dream that he's invading. He's not in the world of dreams, or else Rand would have actually killed himself with that sword. This is just in yes. Rand's personal dreams, not tell her. Yeah, Ishi has created a, a bubble or whatever. It's like a, a dream shard or an illusion or whatever. But yeah, it's not tell Iron Riyadh proper. Otherwise, that would have been a real bad way to escape that dream, bro. Classic Two Rivers response. Yeah. Oh, you're in a monologue? monologue? Shoot him in the face. <laughs> Punch him in the face. Whatever. Like, instant response of, yeah, no, you, you can talk all you want, but you clearly are a bad person, so I'm going to take you out. Loved Rand's response there. Thought it was great. Yeah. I And then I loved what he did with it. Like, the way he just pushes it in and it pulls that cloth over his, like, I was, I, oh, so good. So creepy. So the question is, what does he look like? Is the flame eyes and mouth a fake to dream projection to creep out the boys that he takes off once he like wants to talk to them in a more normal fashion? Or is that the way he actually looks and he covers and he basically is faking his human appearance during the rest of this battle? I actually third option. He has looked like this for the last 3,000 years, but he's gaining strength and rebuilding his body because of this moment of truth coming up. The way it happens in the books, how he's like drawing on the black cords and like his flesh is filling out and all that. And that weird, weird part at the end of the book, um, it's something to do with like the, his prison coming closer to the real world and like that thinning happening that he's actually able to make himself not look, uh, flamey. flamey. Like he, yeah, not being flamey. Or, I don't know. Um, I, I wanted to have that be that mechanism. Possibly just proximity to the, the boar, to the, exactly. Body, that now that they're if close he's farther to the away, eye. it's, it's harder for him to reach and he has to look more flamey and, and he also can only make like brief appearances in the dreams. That's why he like flashes in and out. Whereas now that they're closer, he can make a, a steady state appearance and be there and maintain his presence and change his appearance and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That makes sense with the partially mm -hmm. bound stuff as well. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed is his hand is always human. It's never burned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So maybe it's all just scare tactics. Maybe he never needed to look flamey if it was just to fuck with the kids. 
Um, but yeah, and also the parallel of the eye of the world is she, he shoots him in Ishii's eye, Ishii pushes the arrow into the eye, with, like, and that doesn't hurt him, which I feel like is very much a analogy for Rand shooting his power into the eye and that actually not hurting the Dark One. Um, and his yep. face, like, gets uncovered here in almost the exact reverse pattern of how it gets covered at the end. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of symbolism and symmetry, I think, happening there, and I love it. Yeah, yeah, the way that thing sort of closes in on his eyes is the same way the power sort of collapses down in on him. That's a good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, great casting. Never oh for once God. doubted this was Ishii. Um, no, the he... Air- mm, he captures that... He captures, he's, in so many ways, he doesn't remind me of Book Ishi because he's more grounded and less of a drama queen in so many ways, but he also captures this, we have battled a thousand times a thousand, you know, the turning of the wheel, angry philosopher, like, I loved his performance. There's definitely something to be said for casting, you know, an Arab man as a villain, but... That performance is just... And I actually had a cool conversation with someone on Twitter about how it's really cool to have an Arab person cast in such a major role, even if it is as a I had no idea he was and, an Arab man. That didn't... Yeah, he's a half Lebanese um, and half Swedish. Um, and as the person on Twitter pointed out, uh, it's not the Swedish part that gets double-checked by the TSA. So, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> um being representation for uh, Mina people, which is very cool. But they're, you know, I I just really want to see a white baddie. So far, we have not gotten a single white baddie, and I want one. Um, Le- Leandrin? But Leandrin has the potential to elevate to a supreme baddie. Um, and I mean, but, but you, you want just a gr- straight, cis, white male, like, dude who just sucks. Yeah. Pretty much. I want to see a white person who's a sadistic, power-hungry fuckface, um, just to balance it out. But uh, much like with all the other castings where it's like, well, we can have a colorism discussion, but also, fucking A, this performance is so amazing that, like, that's that's just an academic thing to have off to the side. Like, definitely think he gets Ishmael, um as a character, which is great. This gives me very much um, Luke and Star Wars vibes. They're like, no, that's not possible. Just that, like, <laughs> being confronted with someone much more powerful on a sort of also a little um, um, swamp planet. <laughs> the other thing I noticed or that I've seen people talk about in this scene is it's like this hand touch is like, does literally everyone in the plot have the hots for Rand? Like, is every Forsaken motivated by thwarted love for Rand? There is so much, like, what is the tension here? Like, were you guys, like, boyfriends at one point? <laughs> like, everyone wants Rand. Everyone wants Rand. It's hilarious. <laughs> I love that. So it's like, you got a plan. I know you. We're like, <laughs> Yeah, his casual uh-huh. picking up a conversation that they've been having, where Rand uh-huh. is like, I just met you. And this guy is like, no, you didn't. We've, we've been t- hashing yeah, yeah. this out for mm-hmm. a long time. Mm-hmm. I love that that incongruity of the long form of Shamael vision versus Rand's like farm boy. I don't know what I'm doing experience. But at the same time, I really like the reference to Rand always having a plan, right? His plan to go to Ruiz and his plan to take over the countries. And like, Rand makes a lot of plans. They don't always go according to plan, but everything from, like, going to um, the city where you can't channel. Uh, Farmatting. Farmatting. I want to say Falta Fardara. Um, <laughs> going to Farmatting to take out the, the Black Cloaks who are betraying him without using the power. That's a plan. To his plan to fight the Dark One. To his plan to unite everybody. To his plan... Like, Ran makes plans. That's what he spends his whole time with Moraine at the end of Book 2 doing, right? Like, they're up in the mountains making plans for months. And then he comes down and she, he won't share them with her. And then he ends up going off to the Waste and that becomes a whole thing, right? Like... Yeah. It's funny that you're saying that because it's like in the next scene, Rand is accusing Moraine of always having a plan. <laughs> um, yeah. So it doesn't matter if it's Zoom. I mean, we're at least talking, right? <laughs> I mean, he's right. I mean, reality is very soft and malleable. And if the two minds are meeting and conversing consciously, like, does it matter? Hmm? If you die on Zoom, you die in real life. <laughs> 
I love how she seems almost concerned for Yeah, Rand. he's like, like, are you? Are you okay? Do you, <laughs> you need some help? Shit together? Right. Like, you need a glass of water? You want like a little pamphlet for like how to get rid of the dark wood? Like. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think he's sort of setting him up to be like, let me help you. Let me guide you. So then you can do the opposite of what I tell you to do, which is exactly what I want you to do. I mean, I, this is all manipulation. Yeah, he's not. He does not need to know Rand's plan. He does not think Rand would give him his plan. He is entirely trying to prepare Rand for a conversation that will happen in a couple of hours. Like, he knows. He, he sees this all coming from a mile away. He's setting this up like Moradin, you know? Like, this is like Moradin gaming stuff out kind of setup. Um, and it's also interesting how he keeps phrasing himself as the Dark One. But it's not like, oh, you came ever saying me, it. And it's like, did you? Yeah, well, he's he, he's just yeah. leaning into that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I mean, but, yeah, we don't we don't know where accurate. she was during during the last battle, but yeah, it, it is very very accurate to the books that Ishi and the Dark One are not clear on who is who. I like this version of Ishi that's a little more Moradin esque, a little more not mm -hmm. quite as insane, not quite as just not quite as driven insane by the true power and more grounded in humanity like the the ishamael who is baal zaman is very out of touch with like how people are motivated and how to talk he's just like i will kill you unless you do what i say and that's like it you know like wheel takes um ali and gus often say like it would have been so much simpler to just offer him like a fast horse like boys like to go fast that would have been way better than being like i'll kill you like original book of Shamael is so unbelievably evil. This guy's way more believable. Like you said, way less insane, way more like Moradin. And I like that. It's it, he, we get more of the philosophy, more of the arguments. It's, it's more intellectual and less emotional. Sorry. I love Rand pulls out the sword. Moradin's like, Ooh, fancy imaginary sword. You got there, boy. In a dream <laughs> that can't actually affect me. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, ooh, fancy paring knife you have there. Yeah. He just grabs it, like, whatever, it's fine. <laughs> just, oh, that's cool, let me look at that. Mm -hmm. How does he know Juandan has been dead a long time? Well, Did he, he was, uh, well, uh, he was killed by a dark friend. Well, no, no. he was killed by, by more than Slayer. a dark friend. He was killed by yeah. Slayer, but a, a person associated with the Dark. So, I mean, one of one of the Dark's henchmen did the deed. So it's easy to see that, easy to see why he would be like, yeah, I know your father's dead. Um, this is also the first time we get the name Heron Mark Sword. No, it's not. Min said it before. But still. Um, yeah. It's, it's not brought up and, a lot in the early episodes, know, but yeah. 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 And, and we know... Um, that Rand already knows all this stuff. Like, you know, it's just like, oh, I'm telling you that he's not your father. And Rand ha has known that already. Like, that's not really a revelation to Rand. And I think Ishi was expecting it to be. I mean, he, in the same way that, yeah, he raised me. He's my father, right? Like, well, of course, he, this guy would devalue that relationship because it's not genetic. He's that kind of asshole. <laughs> Glad you're right about that one, Rand. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the way that he just goes right for that is like, yeah. dude, you didn't get a sheathing the sword lecture. You haven't really done a lot of suicide ideation. Like, you went from a scared farm boy to someone who will just unhesitatingly stab himself on faith that it's a dream. Is like, you, what? I that was surprising to me. That was surprising to me as well. Yeah, because it was no, it was like this is a dream. It's like, no, it's not. Yes, it is. Like, I would just, a little back and forth there would have been nice. Yeah. But, I mean, maybe there's also some sort of, like, Rand is starting to learn the texture of dreams because he's had enough of these horrific, like, pseudo-nightmare things. And he's like, no, no, this is definitely a dream. And if it's not, then I still don't want to have this conversation. Like, I don't know. I don't know. It was surprising, but I'm not going to get too upset about it. I like that that was an immediate echo of what actually happened in the dream. Yeah, no, he... Is she is working with what he's actually got with actual reality to make the illusion all the more creepy. And there was no moss growing over his hand when he woke up in the real world. Yeah. Yeah. Not at all. Um, which I, it would have been cool if it had been, but whatever. Good call. That's not an answer. <laughs> Moraine's that's, that's not an answer. 
Mm-hmm. And but I mean, honestly, it, Moraine deserves that. <laughs> no, but also like, what if some of what he was saying was the truth, and then you, then you don't believe him, right? That's the that's a bit of a problem. Like he can tell you the truth, and you mix in with a bunch of lies, and you're like, wait, I don't believe that either. I mean, it's a very Aes Sedai thing to use the truth to lie and to use lies to tell the truth. Like, that is what Aes Sedai has been 3,000 years doing. Um, probably longer, honestly. So, yeah, it would have probably been good to share info with Moraine, but also just assume it's all a game and just go punch him in the face. Like, that's not a bad strategy for Moraine sitting. <laughs> no. The problem is his face is, like, plastered over the seal, and when he punches it, it's just breaking the seal. <laughs> <laughs> Saw Angriel. Would have been fine with it just being an Angriel. Would have been actually a lot happier with it just being an Angriel. Didn't see the reason. Like, Saw Angriel are supposed to be incredibly rare. Like, a couple, a handful of them all around the world. Well, I got the idea that this was incredibly rare. I, th- I got the impression that this was a singular item that does not have many equals. Um, I was fine with it being a saw on Grial. What I'm not happy about is what the fuck were you going to do with it if it was a Gwen? Yeah. Yeah. A yeah, Gwen couldn't have uh, used this. Why well, travel around with a male saw on Grial? Like, it just, it doesn't. I mean, unless, like, men and women can use, can either one can use on Grial and they're not having the, like, attuned to men, attuned to women distinction. But she talks about how, like, a thousand men put their strength into it mm-hmm. and all of that stuff. And I'm just like, so do you have a, is it a match set? You've got one for a girl, one for a boy? Like, why would you carry this around if it only works for half the potential candidates and you actually thought it was a Gwen this whole time? Like, what Is the this fuck? the Choden call? No. No. It's no. a statue of a dude. Why not? Why not have it connect to a bigger statue? Because he's not holding a glowy bulb thing. It's got to have the hand with the ball. The, the. <laughs> no! <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> I I think of this as being the fat man, Angriel. I think that Rand, assuming it doesn't get destroyed in this whole experience, because I'm not sure if it still exists as an artifact after this thing, but mm-hmm. if it does, I think this is going to be our fat man with a sword, Angriel. But I also think it might have dissolved in the confrontation. So mm, not, I didn't catch that. I'm not, but yeah. Well, and the way that she describes it as being like a bunch of men like put their energy into it, which is not how Angriol are made. Battery rather than an amplifier. Yeah, I'm wondering if the eye of the world, the pool in the books, has been turned into this artifact. Like narratively speaking, they made this a concentrated, like you know dried out dehydrated pellet of power <laughs> um and power and he concentrate uses it. just yeah, add male like, channelers yeah right and then he like uses it in the in the course of the confrontation but the the hole in that is that we see the taint being part of his channeling during the confrontation which if my theory was right i think he wouldn't have had the taint um, and he's channeling through it not channeling from it you know yeah so i, I we need we need a tower montage with Varen explaining about Angrial, Saw Angrial, Ter Angrial, men and women. We just need a nice ten minute Varen lore dump in the tower in season two, like to just make this make more sense because it's very much just a scattershot of random information that doesn't hold together right now for me. I guarantee you're going to feel a lot better after a ten minute dump in the tower. <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah, don't we all? I think, I mean, this just goes back to the whole, like, there's so many pieces of information you have to ignore to make the dragon female. Which, I don't know. I mean, Moraine is explicitly throwing out everything she knows and starting from scratch every time she goes through the chain of reasoning. But it's... It is weird that if she wasn't sure which of the five was the dragon, that she didn't have the boys also meet Swan? Like, so Rand's never met Swan. Will he have a chance to meet Swan before she gets to pose? Like, is that whole conversation, like, 
not going to happen. Right, we took him all the way to Tarvalon and didn't even meet with any of... Right, and in The Great Hunt, in the books, she met with all of them. She met with all of the Two Rivers kids in order to spread out, you know, the attention. Um, and yeah, here in the books, she only meets with the women. Um, and ostensibly, you know, Egwene did the whole ring thing, so there, there's a reason for an audience there, but Nynaeve gets brought along like nothing, and then the boys don't. It's... I'm really curious if this is like just because of the way they chose to write it or if this is really suffering from the edits. Because this feels like weird writing to me, but maybe it was just the editing? Like, I, I don't know. Ever since the day I channeled, I hear nothing. So that sort of makes it sound like that was the first time. She, there's definitely no channeling for Breakbone Fever. This is significant. Or is that the point that she realized she could channel and therefore develop the block? Yeah, I I was very perplexed by this line at first, but then when I was on Twitter, I saw someone have, they actually had a quote, there is a bit from the book where she thinks about exactly this happening to her. Ever since she learned she could channel, she's been pushing at those flutters at the corner of her mind. Um, that is a canonical book uh, statement. And so I think it has to do more with her awareness of channeling. Because um, yeah, at first I was like, oh, this means she didn't channel. And it, no, this is... It's it, this is psychological. I think I don't see this as breaking the breakbone fever story. No, and this goes back to the Nynaeve shot first of the podcast. So if you're not familiar, when Nynaeve is breaking Egwene and Perrin out of the White Cloak camp, there is lightning that comes down from the sky, and its assumption is that it's Moraine. But I think Nynaeve does the first bolt because there's a bolt and then a pause and then multiple other bolts. I think that first one was Nynaeve, and that only makes sense because at that point, she's not aware she can channel. She's still channeling unconsciously and has not developed the block that later comes in. So, it, it, and that makes that it makes sense because at that point, Maureen has not told her she can channel. No, she's told her she can learn. No, she can channel. She knows at that point because that conversation happens the first time they meet. Because she's like... Uh, I know that you've healed at least Perrin or Egwene because how else did you find them when we were in the city? Um, so they've had that conversation already. No, it's, the f it's when Nynaeve joins their party and they are tracking the kids and then they come across uh, Perrin and Egwene and have to break them out of the camp. Um, yeah. So... This proves that I was wrong about it being the sheep being skinned alive on bell time. This is just the sense of tortured souls rippling through the ether, um, definitively. That, that's... Trollocs coming, yep. Yeah, but it, it had nothing to do with the sheep. It's just the presence of twisted souls on the pattern. Um, also, like, when Nynaeve has to ask for Egwene's opinion, because you know that that's hurting her pride just a little bit that she has to look to her apprentice and be like, I can't do it. Can you do it? Like, let's, you know, and it's not like she's doing it in anger, but it's still like that, that hurt her pride a bit. I was confused as hell about that. Like, why did the tree fall down? Was there something coming? And why did she instantly assume everything was fine? Like, with what I know about the blight, I would be like, it's a trap. Back the fuck up. You know, like that it was way too sinister. It's way too dangerous of an environment for them to be like, oh, it was just a branch falling. Like, the trees will eat you. That's that's canonical in the show. And the trees will eat you. Why are you not concerned that the trees are dropping chunks of themselves at you? This should be concerning for at least 0.5 seconds. Okay, so we don't get the whole fish can't teach a bird to swim type situation. She makes it sound like the only reason she can't teach him is in the process of teaching. It, he will go mad mm -hmm. because it's tainted. But otherwise, if it wasn't tainted, she could totally teach him how to channel. That is the implication doesn't mean that the other explanation wouldn't also hap wouldn't apply. I mean, that explanation might come up later, but it was weird to me that she didn't just go, nah, it's too different. Don't worry about it. It's like, I can't. Yeah. Sidar and Sidene are different. Like, no one said Sidar and Sidene, except again in the intro. Yeah. It's, it's, mm, is it, 
what what is going on there are we setting up for different rules or was it that she legitimately because i mean i've always thought that it's bullshit that men and women can't teach each other the basics because you're putting yourself into a meditative space you're focusing on a thing you're feeling a thing like there's a lot of basics and yeah i, I don't and again I don't this is like where the that. bonus content says one thing and the show seems to say something else and how much of that is unreliable narrator? I don't know. But, you know, we get that animated short, Sidene, Sidar, and the stone, right? They really do talk about these two different parts of the... So, like, on that half, I'm like, yes, absolutely, they're aware of it. Same thing with the bonus content, right? All the written stuff very much talks about this separation. But then we go into the show, and it's like, it seems like they've made a change in the show. Yeah, um, but also, she could just be dodging. Because she doesn't say she can't, she says she won't. Because madness is a fickle thing. And I honestly feel like this is giving more evidence for Elida. Codswain? Not being Leandrin. Uh, maybe mm. Codswain. But I, uh, there was a comment from Rafe about how there's two characters with names that start EL that are coming in the next season that are highly anticipated. And they've a- announced one of them. So that's Elaine. Elida's the other obvious one. Well, Elon Morton. Elon Morton. Like, there's <laughs> more than... Um, yeah, I don't know. I uh, think... Elida... I, I feel uh, like my El- Elandrin hypothesis is coming apart a bit um, with this comment, because this is so straight out of New Spring, and that's Elida, and there's been so much speculation of, is, are we keeping her or not? That and, Le- and Leandrin is in the same age cohort as... Moraine, so wouldn't have been in a position to come and beat her as an eyes to die. Um, I've always in the books, they were... she could be slightly older in the show. Slightly older, but the idea that Moraine was looking up to her throughout her training doesn't match at all. I mean, even the way Leandrin like seems to give a backstory to uh, Nynaeve about it, still felt like they were in the same age cohort. So I'm leaning strongly towards Elida. I could see Cad Swain and I could see Leandra. And I mean, we'll just have to wait and see. But I'm, I'm voting for Elida at this point. But also the beatings makes me think it was a dark friend. More so than... But Elida did beat her in the books and was not a dark friend. Like... Because she's helping. It's not a, It's not as a weapon. It's as a motivator. Which is... Uh, yeah, and I just... Cad Swain, it, that seems too hands-on for Cad Swain to just be messing with novices. It's just... It's such an Elida move. Mm. Um, but the one thing it also says is that, yeah, the spanking and the beating is from the books is definitely at least referred to. Corporal That's punishment accept- is very real. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. It's the night alone thing plus the Leandrin touch that makes me think possibly Leandrin. And I mean, Leandrin's backstory to Nynaeve totally could work for. I had this protege and I thought she was going to be all this stuff. And then she went and chose the blue. Like it, it, it absolutely could still be Leandrin. And that will add so much weight to rewatching, you know, those sequences. Uh, once we learn for sure who it was. Um, yeah. Interesting stuff there. Yeah. That is probably my biggest objection over everything else. The taking what is a very hard magic system and making it soft. That when you need it, it'll be there. All you have to do is wish for what you want and it'll do what you need. Your instincts will kick in. None of that is true. In the books. Now, it happens for Rand because he's a very special boy who has memories of his past life. But that is not how the One Power works for anybody else. Well, it does for Wilders on their first touching. That's how first touchings happen for Wilders, is you're in a desperate situation for your life. You want something very badly, and it happens. The idea that that's how channeling works entirely is wrong. But that is mm-hmm. how it works that's, that's what for I'm saying, yeah. Wilders on their first touching. In a very specific situation, in a, for a very specific... And they can really only do, like, want a couple of very rare things. It's either compulsion or listening. Like, it's rare. Well, no, th- those are the tricks. The tricks are different. First touchings and tricks are not the same thing. 
because we get a description when uh, Nynaeve is first having that conversation with Maureen uh, in Eye of the World. And she's saying, you know, shall I tell you how it happened the first time? Maybe you were drowning and needed a branch to fall. Maybe you wanted someone to get well. Like it, the, the first touching thing is very, very broad. It's just you want something more than you've ever wanted. And it happens. The compulsion thing that Varen works out is is it's like when they learn how to harness it in a really rough way and it is repeatable the tricks are are repeatable things whereas the first touching is just this explosion that happens but if what what bothers me about this is the idea that Moraine had a block and only needed to break it once because that's not how Elida beat her in the books in the books Elida was beating her to learn how to do the hundred weaves faster it's not that Maureen was having trouble channeling and just needed that one breakthrough. That the story she's giving here is basically what happened to um, that one red Shariam. sister who yeah, uh... Shiriam, but that one red sister in Saladar uh, who talks about being Tarna. Tarna tells uh, Elaine, I think, something about how. Or no, tells Nynaeve, like, you know, you're being coddled here. You know, I used to not be able to channel until the head of the Red Aja, Galena, beat it out of me. And that's kind of what Moraine is saying here. And Moraine never had a block. She was being beaten repeatedly night after night to learn to channel faster, not beaten once to learn how to channel at all. Like, I just, they're meshing stories, backstories here. And I, I don't like the idea that Moraine had a block. <laughs> I just, I don't like that. Yeah. And I, I don't, I don't like the first touchings being the main, like I, one thing I, I don't think first touchings are quite as universal. I don't know. I, that just seems no, wilder first touchings when they don't have a guide. That's the whole idea is when you don't have a guide and you're a sparker, it's going to come out, but it won't come out until a moment of crisis. But to just have that be the whole explanation is it, it cheapens the, the training, system. the years, yeah. Like, why even be a nice Sedai if that's just put your life in danger and you'll make it happen? Yeah. Also, like, the part where she's being apparently put in danger by the Aes Sedai using the power on her, like, danger of your life is kind of getting a little three oath pushy. Because you're not supposed to be able to use it to hurt people to the point that they might die. Like... <laughs> Yeah, I, it just, uh, yeah. I just I don't see a lot of weaving. I see a lot of pushing power at something and wishing, which makes this a soft magic system rather than weaving very specific weaves that do a very specific thing. Um, and I feel like that's true for all of the Aes Sedai, all of the weaving. It's like, oh, to heal somebody, all you do is dump power into them and wish for them to get better. There's no complex set of weaves that you have to create. But we also have shielding had specific motions. We had uh, stilling had specific motions. And we see with the Sean chant that raising a tsunami has specific motions. So, like, I can't tell how soft they're making it. Like, are they just spoon feeding us very small bites and they're going to get more technical? Or have they actually dumbed it down this far? Like, I'm not... I don't know, and I'm mad that they're not giving me a solid or explanation to work with at this point, because I want to either be mad or not mad. I don't want to have to hang in the middle, unsure of how mad I should be. Yeah, so it, it just, I, it seems like they're removing the skill. It's like, you know, everyone has a certain level of skill and a certain level of power, and those two combine to create, you know, really interesting combinations. And it feels like they're just being like, no, your level of power is all that matters. Your skill doesn't really affect. But it does, because otherwise, why would you have a yellow Aja with a reputation for being good at healing? If it's just power levels, then it would be any eyes to die of a certain strength is good at healing. Like they setting us up as like yellow sisters are the most skilled at healing. This suggests that there are rules and talents and maneuvers. But we also saw a lot of sisters, the yellow sisters using herbs and other things. Maybe they're just as good at healing with the one power as anybody else, but they know a little more about physical healing herbs and stuff like that. I, I'm, I'm not decided how mad I'm going to be yet, and I'm mad that I don't have answers to how mad I should be. No, no. See, whereas I'm, I'm sort of making the assumption that I can be a little more mad, that they're just taking away a lot of the hardness. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're 
I, I think you're going to be pleasantly disappointed <laughs> um, when we get to some training montages with the Shan Shan and in the tower and with the Aiel. I'm really holding out hope for, I, for that. No, yeah, I'm not. Because, because I was because expecting they're... I was expecting something of a training montage in episode one. We got nothing. We didn't get Moraine with Egwene. We didn't get anybody in the White Tower. We got absolutely zero training montage. And there was tons of opportunity for it. Tons. But they're trying to bring show people along and they have to have something really cool to bust out in season two that wasn't in season one. And I think power training montage is a high contender for that. What is new about the world in season two to exposition at us. Uh, and then I guess the other thing that we haven't gotten at all is the, the five powers, right? It's hard to make a harder magic system when a big part of the hard magic system is, oh, here are the elements that we combine in these ways and these different combinations produce different results. Instead, you have the one power, which is one thing with no components and you just use it. Yeah, that that se- doesn't seem like they're going for five powers and i i have a vanishingly small hope that we're going to get that i don't i think we're going to get maneuvers and s- weaves and skills i don't think we're going to get the five powers so that's my and be- for me because the magic system in the wheel of time is so unique and so detailed and a large chunk of what i like about this. that that the pov and the pov writing are my two favorite things you know so oh Okay, chat's pointing out we did get weaves of air and fire described, but that doesn't mean five powers. It just means the results. Or it doesn't mean the five powers. She has a good point. She did say weaves of air and fire, but then it's like, are we not? But we're not seeing them. Yeah, and that, uh, yeah. But again, if we, if we do get training montages that give us more of the technical things, that would be the time to introduce that there are five powers. Like, I just they can't give us the whole magic system in one season. That would be very boring for the other seasons. They have to be able to keep adding to the costumes, the cultures, the world, the magic. Like, they have to be able to keep building the magic into something more with each successive season, I think. And this, I guess this comes down to maybe disagreeing with some of the decisions of what was on screen and what was off screen. Mm-hmm creepy starfish it really does look like those you, you watch the david attenborough um documentary mm-hmm. of the starfish yeah you brittle stars all, ice... all swarm yeah yeah yeah, yeah. the 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 brine brinicle uh yeah which yeah. if anyone hasn't seen that uh definitely go look it up but fundamentally it's a time lapse of a bunch of brittle stars getting essentially attacked by a cyclone of briny water and getting frozen um it's a very fascinating video highly recommend it as everything david attenborough does you should go watch it it's good and it looks surprisingly like this it looks a <laughs> like, lot like this <laughs> yeah. so and again she tells him you're okay back to Min back to them confronting mm-hmm. her yes, looking for answers him. she tells the guy you're going to want to move before the Emmons mm-hmm. Field 5 walk in yeah I think that that's one of those it comes with the territory she's just like I'm going to get these These guys are going to come talk to me you're going to be yeah. I think that's her just knowing human nature. I don't think that's a vision. <laughs> oh, see. Oh, but I always thought it comes to the territory was a vision. That yeah, she's no, you're able right. That, that is what that line was for. But I don't think yeah. this is. No, I mean, when she says it comes with the territory, that's when she knows he's going to come back and talk to her. I don't think it's because it's a vision. It's because she knows that there's more that they have to talk about. I think with this, she's like, I know that these guys are going to come in and yell at me about the stuff that's happening and I mean, she's a bartender. She knows people. Yeah. So I was, I always, I saw that as I am a little proph- prophetic and I am able to just, I know a bunch of stuff before it happens because showman is much more powerful than bookman in terms of her visions, what she knows, what she controls, what she sees. Yeah. There's also a bit of smoke and mirrors that comes when you have power that allows you to stretch it a little bit. I mean, we see that with Cat's uh-huh. Yeah. You know, she puts where she sets up the her box. reputation. So I, you know, Min's been doing this for a long time. There may be a certain amount of just skill with her skill uh, and how that applies to her life. Um, because fortune tellers tend to just, you know, know what they're doing to a certain degree. Um, but it could also be that she's more prescient just in a very straight ahead, powerful way. And I would like that less. Um, the one thing I'll say about that guy in the background uh, who's cooking, um, those sleeves are way too baggy, man. 
Yeah, you're seriously. Get caught in something. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna yeah. get caught on fire is what they're gonna get. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like men me sleeveless. That's that's what you want to be for, you know. Hmm. I love that response. <laughs> you're the one yeah. in the bar. It's like you're a bartender. Like we came here to see you. Or I wouldn't be in the bar if you weren't the bartender. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, but she's just putting them off because she doesn't want to have a real conversation. Um, I'm just curious how Loyal ends up getting drug along on this party. I want to know the conversation where it was like, Loyal, yeah, you should come with us. I mean, obviously, they've been traveling together for a bit, but it's it's just funny that Loyal is now one of the hangers on to the party. He's been hanging in with Perrin. Mm, yeah. Yeah. He's also the only one that sits down. I wonder why Loyal bothers to sit down. Because it's easier to make it look like he's taller when he's sitting. Mm, fair. <laughs> so that's a preview of Nynaeve burning at the end of the episode. Yeah, she just basically, like, suddenly is like, oh, fuck, a battle's coming. She just gets this flash of, like, battle is about to happen, and... Because when she sees Nynaeve burning out, and then she sees the soldiers all dying, and then the war bells go off, and she's like, fuck, that was fast. <laughs> yeah. Everyone there, like, let's see, one guy gets his throat slit, one guy looks like he gets his stomach taken out, and the other guy looks like his face gets burned off. Yeah, that's brutal. Yeah, and it kind of echoes what happens to her in the tower in the books, where she sees, you know, the coup ahead of time. There seems to be an element of timeliness to men's visions that's maybe not so much in the books. In the books, it's very much like, well, it's going to happen eventually sometime. Now it does, very much seems like, oh, this is about to happen. Yeah. I mean, she saw the whole Rand's life story with Tam before Tam ever went to the mountain. But it might have been like a few days before he went to the mountain. So, yeah. I mean, he was in Tarvala, and so I assume that was literally during the war right before he went up to the mountain. Because why else would he be in Tarvalon? Yeah. Now, in the books, it happens over a wide range of scales. Sometimes she sees things a few minutes ahead of time. Sometimes it's days. Sometimes it's years. Uh, it seems like they're, for narrative purposes, making it more on the short side on average. Uh, but we'll see. I mean, maybe she's going to get a vision about, you know, the finale of the entire show in, like, the cold open of season two or something like that. It just won't make sense until we get to, to the end. This is the other thing that will just make me be like, wait. They can look back and see Faldara. Mm -hmm. How they've gone what, like two miles, right? Mm -hmm. Like they could not have gone far. They can see the individual figures of the Trollocs, which either is shitty storytelling or reality is warping because of the Dark One's prison. Being I'm really sold on this Dark One's prison thing. It resolves so much of my anger at their travel montage. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, that's the only way I can be like, it, three years ago, it was further away. I'm like, how the hell does the Seven Towers move? Well, I mean, reality has to be distorting. It's the only way. Yeah, and I mean, I could totally buy that it's taken them half a day to climb two miles through this nonsense. Like, that makes sense. But um, mm -hmm. to have the yeah, blight, or to have the eye be almost with an eye shot of the gap doesn't make sense unless it's wibbly wobbly space. Or have five real awesome channelers, you know, have one naive power or lightning strike. That also will do it, apparently. Because nothing Rand does affects him. But it is a very blue thing for her to say, to walk away from a battle in an effort to win the war. The way that she's able to just, like, not have any hesitation about that choice is very, like, this is what a blue does, which is cool. The cause. Uno! <laughs> <laughs> not not very many lines, but at least he curses in every single one of them. And the way that he like struts with his shoulders, like he just clearly Guy Roberts has been a fan since 1990 and is literally a boy, a little boy exploding on the inside every time he gets to be Uno. And it just radiates out of him and gives me so much joy. Ingtar alert! <sighs> yeah. I so wasn't the actor who said that supposed to be Inktar? I don't know. This guy um, right because away. I wasn't following uh, casting news that long ago, but recently they did announce who Inktar is, and it's not that guy. Um, explicitly, I don't know if that changed because I haven't followed casting news across the whole process that long. It might have been entirely speculation that he was supposed to that he was 
And he looks a lot like the guy that did get cast for Ingtar. Like, I mean, the idea that that is a Shinaran lord who has significance is like, I mean, it works, but, um, it's, yeah, I don't know. But, oh my god, the freaking costumes. All of these, these outfits are amazing, and I've read good praise about how they are properly inspired from uh, nice other cultures, and costumers are like, yes, this is accurate, and that's accurate, and the, the cosplay potential, and oh my god, I just, so cool looking! Ah! Everything from her dress with the yellow circles to, yeah, everything is so good. Mm-hmm. Oh. Chat saying that some subtitles still show this as Ingtar? Oh. Okay. So this... That's the eye. Now, it doesn't seem to me that the blade is emanating from that. It seems like it's crawling into it. Yeah, which definitely does point to maybe some uh, unreliable narrators with incomplete information are uh, doing this. This is the first place where I actually got to do a little bit of real world research because I heard someone or saw I heard I saw someone on Twitter say that um, this is like uh, these Indian wells, like actual architecture. And I went and looked it up. And yes, this is a step well is uh, yes. what it's called when it has the, the stairs that go down. And it is um, a thing that people in India worked out how to build because of the extreme seasonality of their rainfall. And their need to like ca- uh, capture water in tanks as well as be able to access groundwater. Um, and there are many, many, many of them um, in the Indian subcontinent. And lots of them are beautifully decorated. Um, but it's one of those like, hey, they got inspiration from something other than like Gothic cathedrals, which is neat. Also, I noticed in the um, the the gap it's, or the yeah the gap itself has this same zigzagging stair pattern. Obviously, it's not circular; it's a wall. But this is. It kind of feels like the same architecture, and I'm like, so the Shinar like have a level of like architectural continuity with in the Age of Legends somehow. Like they kept building in that design because that's what was here. Like I don't know, but they recycled this inspiration at least. Um, what do you think about him having those memories, knowing this place? Not a big fan of him starting to have memory bleed through this early. But if reality is bending and space doesn't mean what it does, then maybe that means that the veil on his mind is a little bit thinner and warpier. I'm not the biggest fan of him just being like, I know this place. It feels really tropey in a way that I, I don't like that trope when I find it anywhere in fantasy. It's not my favorite. And for him to be leaning into it sooner than in the books is like, I hope that that dials back for a couple of seasons and we get more just straight ahead Rand. Um, yeah. I don't know. What about you? Yeah. I mean, I'd like to see, I would have liked to see more channeling before he started having those memories. Um, because that's supposedly the, the corruption breaking down the barrier is what causes the memories to form, not him just being reborn. But maybe they're leading into those as separate effects. Maybe they're the being the dragon reborn is what gives him the memories and the channeling is just what drives him mad. Or maybe he's only getting memories because he's in this space and reality is thin here. And the, that's going to not be a thing if he's elsewhere until the madness is more advanced. Like, uh, She believes it does. <laughs> she just stares at him like, the fuck do you think? <laughs> That smile that she gives. Yeah. She's like, no, I've lived my whole life for this. I'm going in there. She's like, I've spent 20 years being ready to die in this moment. Like, you can't take this. What would have been cool in this moment? To see Lan, like, find something that Moraine dropped or see what he was tracking. Or hack a trollic apart or evade a stick or do some weird, watery, mysterious thing to, like, something. Something have any reaction at the sight of his towers. Oh, he grimaces. His scowl got a 5% deeper than it was already. <laughs> it's a motive for Lan. <laughs> Not so much for Lan Hill, though. So. Makes me wonder, how many Trollocs are they sending at the gap? Are they sending, like, if a thousand is supposed to be, like, two met is, like, a huge number. Are they sending, like, a hundred Trollocs at a time? Like... Yeah, I'm perplexed by these numbers, especially because they then spend a day slaughtering Trollocs at the Gap and then when they break through, Nynaeve's like, there's still 10,000 of them. I'm like, 
So they have 100,000 Trollocs to send now and have only ever sent 1,000 across all the generations before? Like, am I just bad at numbers or are books bad at numbers? Like, I, mm-hmm. mm, I'm i really... I don't, yeah, I don't know that much about true numbers, but yeah. It's it just, it's it feels incongruous to me, the numbers that we get given in this episode. Well, especially because it doesn't look like it when you see the CGI. You know, oh, I'm, I'm like, throwing the CGI out completely. I, I'm not even thinking. I'm just working with the written script because that's what they could control. Um, as opposed to CGI, which was very much uh, COVID issues. Um, and we see her put the, this armor on. Yeah. So yeah, she puts the armor I, I on like before that. she goes out. <laughs> I did like that. I dig the part where she's like, well, fine, you're not going to wear it. Then I'm going to wear it. I also do wonder, though, about like, doesn't armor like kind of wear out if you keep getting hit with it like wouldn't it need to be replaced after uh, hundreds of battles ship of theseus is sort of what i'm thinking with this one. Oh, okay but maybe okay. replace some pieces but it's like the same armor but like maybe not all the pieces are some only some of the pieces are original or none of them might be at this point i, I can um, buy that yeah i also imagine that in those hundreds of battles the majority of them are sat up on the wall shooting arrows right like uh, yes it fair. kept him safe but like i imagine very few actual physical engagements occurred yeah that's true i also question how many hundreds of battles a person can fight in their life yeah hundreds really hundreds because yeah. fighting that's that means that's a battle every day for a year to get to hundreds you know Right, and so if you have, say, a 30, 40-year career of fighting, you're going to need to have, like, a hundred, like, 50 to 100 battles a year. It's just, it reminds me of that time when Tom yells at one of the boys for thinking, or, yeah, for thinking that, like, uh, that one swordsman could have possibly fought, like, a hundred duels in a day, and he's like, that's bullshit, right, use right. your brains. And I, I kind of feel like Tom in the situation, like, does that math make any sense? I don't know. Well, especially because, like, who's attacking the Gap? Nobody's attacking the Gap. They're attacking the little villages, but the Gap stands as a fortress. Yeah, there's... In... It's one of those things where, like, they're not sending wave after wave after wave of Trollocs against it every couple of days. It's like, no, they, they're they raiding... This is the fortress that's safe, and then the Trollocs raid villages and towns and... I mean, we have the song, the We're Coming Home from Tarwin's Gap. We know that there have been big epic battles at Tarwin's Gap repeatedly throughout the centuries. But yeah. But not in one person's lifetime. Yeah. No. And I mean, maybe, you know, dude was out going on patrols and protecting villages. And that was part of how he racked up his hundreds of battles was, you know, protecting villagers in their villages. It wasn't always at the Gap. But... <sighs> Which I would have liked to see more of a payoff of the women holding the city. Yeah, I was very disappointed that the commander of holding the city puts herself on the front lines such that she won't be able to command the defense of the city when the Trollocs hit the city. She's leaving it to whoever her second in command is, who we never get any character development for, never a name, never a face. It's like, I understand a lot of the strategy that happens here, but... The part where she's planning on falling before the city has had a single blow struck to it is like, Captain, ship, are, are these not concepts? Like, also, couldn't she have done what she did from up on the battlements? That's a frequent complaint. I see it more as layers that she, I mean, she went out there intending to die, in my opinion. Um, right, which means she's going to leave the city to be defended by not a member of the royal family, which is... Like, that that feels irresponsible to me as far as the whole like we protect the city the city doesn't fall like shouldn't he falls with the gap you fall with the city like yeah well, I'm, I'm the putting him out front never did not make any sense i also did, like do they not have aid in the books i can't remember what the deal is um why there aren't a lot of ice to die on the on in the tower or in the gap they don't have any ice to die in the gap they all come after the fact uh, in Great Hunt, they don't have any channelers to to bring to bear on that discussion in Tarwin's Gap. But in the books, they're like, we're going to throw them back like before. They don't go from there's no threat to it's Tarwin Gaiden. They're just like, yeah, there's a threat, but we'll deal with it. So, um, I mean, I like this whole sequence in terms of how it gives us the the Borderlander folklore and the family folklore and just that whole culture. Like, but it feels like and very self-sacrifice clum- and everything like that. 
but it yeah. feels like very clumsy uh, honoring of how the world was built and constructed. And it's, you know, I won't claim to know anything about military strategy and how well the arrangements were on that front, but it this feels like a strange collage of the stuff we got from the books that doesn't quite hold together, even though I love their characterizations and their deliveries. Like, they do wonderful work with what they've got, but it's just... There's odd. The strategy gaps. is weird. Yeah. Oh, chat's chat's correcting us. In the book, he did think Moran was answering his call for help. So that was a call that was made in the books. And then Moran's like, <laughs> psych, I'm actually going to skedaddle on through here. <clears throat> so that's because the call, I don't think, had time to get there and back, basically. Yeah. It was just a coincidence that she showed up mm-hmm. at the right time. Like, why does he even draw that? It's not like he uses it against the Trollocs or anything. He sticks that sword in his belt and like, okay. Well, would love to have seen some him whipping that out. I mean, they ride their war horses in and then they just act as archers in a wall the whole time. Like, it, uh... like that was Chekhov's sword right there. That never <laughs> got unsheathed. Yeah. Also, he talks about buying time, but they really don't delay the forces at all. They just kind of kill some of them. Like, it doesn't feel like delaying tactics in the slightest. Well, I mean, killing them all, in theory, would delay them, right? <laughs> I mean, I but he's saying we can't kill them all, right? Yeah, and then she kind of does. A little well, bit. yeah. Um, yeah, and there's, there is a thread that exists on Twitter that I haven't read that's been posted in chat about how her strategy actually does make a lot of sense with going out in front. And doing that, I have not read the thread. Um, I believe that there's logic to it. I just would have liked a single line where she hands the keys to the city to her second in command and says, if I fall, you know what to do. It would have taken like one second and we don't get it. And so it, it feels incomplete to me. Yeah. I also read that thread and I'm like, if you need that many words to describe why going out into the field makes sense, you're wrong. Like, I'm sorry. Like, it's just... No, I I did not. That thread felt like a lot of excuses and not a lot of strategy. Yeah, I haven't read it yet. I I I, I don't know anything about everything I've learned about military strategy. I have learned from Wheel of Time. So, like, I'm not even qualified to comment on it. I just the narrative setup for that strategy is too threadbare for me to know what the fuck is going on. Which is frustrating. But I mean, as far as I know, military strategy is a thing that takes a lot of words to explain. So, like, I won't fault them on word count. But I also haven't read the thing yet. So, I mean, basically, it makes the assumption that she's cha- she's there on the assumption that she can't kill them all, but she's going to try and funnel them into a kill area that's going to make them easier to. But like all it's all speculation, right? None of that is facts from the show. No, right. the show so it's is like, the fortress oh, could, is going to be impenetrable until the last. That's what they set us up in the show for. And so I just, I'm as I read through it, I'm like, there's a lot of assumptions about what the plan is based on, it's like, and so yes, I've read that thread. I don't, I think it's, again, not that it's unreasonable as a solution, but it's not the solution we're presented in the show. That's n- they did not think about it nearly that much. They thought it would be cool to put them on the field so that we could get a good big field shot of lightning. Like, And I wanted to see the women of Faldara using those like whale harpoons on some Trollocs. Like, they give us a lot of cool weaponry shots that I wanted to see utilized. And we didn't get it. And I propose... That we are now over two hours of recording and just over halfway through the episode. And as we enter into the final battle itself, that we uh, save that for part two. Yep. I think you're right. We're not going to wrap this up in another 20 minutes. So, uh, yeah. Um, Let's let's call it there. Uh, now that we've we have we have ragged on this episode, a we lot. really have, um, yeah. And it, it, that amuses me I because I I keep saying that this is my favorite episode of the whole season, um, and I still stand by that. Actually, despite That's all funny. of this yeah, yeah. shredding that we have done, um, we, we shred with love. We shred from a place of love. <laughs> But when I do say that this is one of my least favorite episodes of the series, it's because that I, I feel like there's a lot to shred in this episode. It's not that I don't love the good parts. It's that I feel like they 
punted on a few things um, or simply just didn't give us the explanation that I wanted. And, and then I think part of that is, too, because I was hoping for so I was in episodes one through seven. There were certain things I was like, OK, this is fine as long as it pays off in episode eight. And a lot of those things didn't pay off in episode eight. And so there weren't the flashbacks. We didn't see Egwene in the pool. We didn't you know, there was. Uh, we didn't see Tam on the road. We didn't get um, an explanation for what Matt was doing. We didn't see Matt and Fane encounter each other. We didn't see how Fane got into the ways. We didn't see, you know, there was a bunch of things that, uh, you know, if you go back and look at our reviews, we're like, okay, we hope this is in episode seven, eight, and they weren't. And so episode eight doesn't necessarily, I feel like it, it, it ends up bearing the burden of a lot of the failed payoffs that were set up in early seasons, early in the season, which is still, can be paid off in other episodes, but, you know, there were a lot of things on the wall that did not get taken down and fired. Um, yeah, there's, um, and so they're still up on the I'm wall. putting a lot of my hopes on future episode on future seasons and the, the letdown potential, the stakes for that just get higher and higher. <laughs> the longer they delay these necessary payoffs. Exactly. Um, exactly. Which, which is a little bit and, rough, but you know, in a lot of ways, this season had a lot of heavy lifting to do, bringing new people in, being the opening season, first seasons are rough, and they had to deal with COVID kicking them in the nuts near the end. And frankly, and Eye of the World so, is the hardest book to adapt. And Eye of the World is Eye of the World. totally, totally. So it's, I can give them a lot of leeway and it's like, you just, I'm, I'm holding you guys to this for season two. <laughs> like, really going to need some of this payoff. Really going to need some payoff. Like, that's pay me. Give me the the, the dough. So, yeah. Um, um, yeah. It's why I put episode seven much higher than episode eight, because I wasn't expecting the payoffs in episode seven. I was fine with the setups in episode seven. Sure. But I was expecting the payoffs in episode eight, and I didn't get them. Yeah. So uh, it's it's rough in that regard, but it's still... I mean, we're still both loving the show and loving the episode on the whole. And uh, all of our tearing this apart comes from a place of love of the books and of the performances. And um, I, I do definitely want to like talk about the whole thing at some point, just like collectively. Um, but uh, maybe for now, we should try to not go too deep down that tangent. Yeah, just a good um, way to uh, random uh, this. Excuse me. Just a good way to wrap up this episode. And I think next time um, I'm really excited to talk about Rand's confrontation with Ishi and everything that goes into that. I think there's a lot of good in that. There's a lot of good in the ending. Um, I really, uh, you know, as much as we ragged on the battle techniques, we still have to talk about the burning out and healing about that. But I do think, you know, there's interesting stuff going on there. I, um, I'm ex I liked the second half of this the battle itself is a pretty exciting part of this episode and I can't wait to get to that. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like I said, on uh, the Tarval and after dark live stream, like for me, the highlight of this episode and of the season is how the confrontation with Rand and Ishi goes down. Like that is to me what carries the whole thing. So I'm very excited to get to part two of our episode eight breakdown, because that is where all of that good stuff happens. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. um, for sure. Um, also would have kind of assumed that the confrontation between Perrin and um, Fain and Pat and Fane would have been written between Matt and Pat and Fane. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would yeah. have had a more emotionally. Yeah. And then and Perrin may have been doing something else. So there's 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 a lot to talk about in terms of like yeah, COVID and, and, and Barney leaving definitely hurt the episode. Um, that being said, yeah. Um, that means there's a lot of growth that can happen for season two. It, there's a huge amount of potential, and we are very excited to see the show grow into the potential that we know it has. Right. And, and I think that's where I am, because I'm unlike with Shannara, where I was like, this show has no potential or um, like sort of truth. Uh, like those shows had no potential after season one. There was no point in continuing to watch them. There was nowhere for them to go. Um, this show is amazing. It just needs a few tweaks and some payoffs. Yeah. 
but they've they've got our screaming endorsement uh, as a fandom to you know keep on going so but for now we should actually wrap this up um please remember to like and comment and follow and subscribe and support on patreon and check out our podcast spoilers on yep. all social media um yes check out the podcast if you happen to somehow be watching this video without knowing who we are in the podcast world please go look up what spoilers <laughs> um and uh yeah keep on re-watching and re-watching and re-watching and uh come back to our channel eventually for part two of this breakdown because obviously we will have part two and uh then we'll be going back to episode we're going back to the book we'll be going back to uh path of daggers (laughs) like jumping forward uh so so far um that that'll be happening shortly um otherwise i think yeah that's that's it Thank you so much for joining us. See you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?